How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back again to the channel for another video. That is right, we have sat here for hours, and I mean hours, over the past few weeks chatting about what each and every single CDL team is going to look like heading in to Major 2. Tons of Roster Mania madness, drama, rumors, the list goes on and on. This Roster Mania had it all, and now it is time to chat about where every team sits now that we know every lineup that is right we know optic texas just announced their roster yesterday it is official hook is joining the team dashi is now headed to the bench we're chatting about all of it in what i like to call the newest youtube series to this channel and your new favorite lando's tears that is right nothing unique nothing special including the logo which absolutely needs to be changed so if anybody would like to let me know uh, and any way to improve it, if you're a graphic designer, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or in the comments below. That needs to change. Uh, but today, we're chatting about where each and every single team now ranks moving in to Major 2. And you could be asking yourself, is Landon going off of an algorithm for this? Is he basing this off of anything in particular? No. We're basing this straight off of just knowledge. Straight off of where I see these teams ranking. Uh, but the best part about this YouTube series, in all seriousness, uh, is that I would love to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments below feel free to let me know where i went off a bit uh if i've gone a little astray if you will where you would have your teams ranked uh moving into major two but like i said this is based off of just where i see current trajectories for teams it's not necessarily based off of exact placements it's based off of upside it's also based off what i think could be downside alongside of what are actual results so it's kind of a mixture of almost everything uh but as i'm labeling it your new favorite series we're doing this before every major so you can look forward to that but here we go into these tiers and as you can see i have labeled them i have indeed they all hold a very unique name something very special in my heart uh and as we go through all of them you will be revealed as to the context of what each of them means now the context for the first one is kind of a spoiler you probably already get it and it's the london royal ravens erm indeed if you've not if you're not familiar with erm then maybe look it up uh, and the reason for that is because we've seen a roster change go down with the London Royal Ravens scraps. Good old Matty Marshall making his return to the CDL in place of Paul X. It's the first time that he's going to be playing uh, in the CDL. I think actually like playing like official COD uh, since Cold War did take the uh, the break during Vanguard and whatnot. So it is interesting, right? That scraps pretty much instantly comes back to the CDL and within one major, he's already back on the roster. I know there's been a lot of criticism uh, a lot of negativity, also a lot of positivity as well. I'm personally very excited to see him back in the league. Uh, but it's difficult because where do you rank a team that has lost their last five series? They started off 2-0 ever since the M4, uh, you know, GA. They've yet to win a series. Uh, they, like I said, they've lost their last five. They don't win a single match at Major 1. They're one of only two pro teams that end up losing to a Challengers team uh, at Major 1 as well. And then you're making a roster change for a player who historically is fantastic, but has been off for a year so it, it's difficult where to rank where to, where to rank the ravens i don't think you could really make a case that they are higher than this if not much higher than this uh but right now somebody has to be at the bottom and i it is going to have to be the london royal ravens we'll see if they could break that streak i do like a lot of players on this team i think there is potential for them to not be the worst team in the league uh but until that is proven until that streak is broken and until i see scraps in an official series it is difficult where to rank the team for right now we will move on we'll move on from the bottom tier to the next tier and we're calling this one any given day any given day now i debated on different names for this tier however i decided on this one and the reason for that is because when it comes to the teams that sit on this tier any given day one of these teams can push you to a game five they can they can sneakily beat you in a series and on any given day it also feels like they could get absolutely ran over if they're not winning their search and destroys uh and, but i do will i will say this put a little caveat on this one don't want i don't, honestly don't 100 know what that word means um but i'm putting a little bit of a of an asterisk here i do feel like one of these teams that is going to be on this list will have a very solid placement at major two i don't know putting that out there in the world we'll start things off the first team here is going to be the Florida Mutineers. I wanted to give the Mutineers the nod. I have talked very highly about Florida uh, to kick off this year. I am not a team that was, or rather, I'm not, a, I'm not a person who was saying instantly coming into the year that they were one of the worst teams in the league. I actually kind of felt like they were not, you know, in the bottom two, bottom three, but maybe a little higher than that. Um, and as much as I want to give them the nod, I just feel like their window to really be dangerous, to really be scary, 
has now passed us. Like major one, I feel like was their opportunity to maybe have a little bit of a higher placement than what they did. After major one, they sit with the lowest hard point win rate percentage at 25%. I don't think they're the worst hard point team in the league, uh, but the record says that they are absolutely at least bottom three. It feels like unless they're facing off against Optic Texas, like it's just a matter of S and D's. And if they're not winning S and D's, then the series is is going down the drain. Uh, but like I said, versus Optic, they got plus 100 power. But the problem is that you're not facing off against Optic. Uh, every single series, uh, they did have a very nice victory versus the LA Thieves to, to close out uh, their major one. So like I said, this is any given day. Sometimes they can beat you. Sometimes, well, they won't because they faced off against the Thieves at major one, the actual tournament, and got 3 0 So again, you know, it, it, it definitely depends. We'll move on to our next roster. And this one is a very difficult one uh, to really... Pinpoint where they're going to sit, and that is the LA Gorillas. Uh, yes, LAG, it's actually really RC's plus the Academy uh, is really what this team is. Uh, they made a massive, massive roster change. Some people critiqued it, said it was a little too much. I actually think that it was just enough, uh, to be honest with you, LAG. To me, I know I just talked about Florida, one of the worst hardpoint teams. I think LAG was that team. Multiple, multiple, multiple 100-point club losses. Uh, where this team just did not have it. At times in control, they looked okay, but most of the time they were getting 3-0'd and felt like if they were winning a respawn, it was really by close fashion, and that was really it. Uh, so I'm excited. The fact that they did make a massive roster change, we saw their academy team come out uh, and look great. This is the best. I mean, now they're no longer in challengers, but this was without a doubt the best challengers team that we had in the game. They've won cups. They obviously uh, you know, managed to beat a pro team when it came down to major number one. They also, after losing and not qualifying for the bracket stage, went into uh, you know, the open tournament, managed to win that as well. So there was no doubt this is the best academy team. So I'm not shocked that we do see the that we do see the actual LAG team pick up all these players. We've got Exceed, we've got Joe Deceives, and we've got Assault, two rookies plus a vet added on to Arsties here. I'm excited to see them. Again, it's very difficult to rank where they sit. I think this is obviously a young team mixed in with a, a veteran lineup. You've got Exceed and Joe Deceives as rookies. Joe Deceives, I think, is late 18. Uh, Exceed has been waiting for this opportunity for a while. I'm very, very high on Exceed right now. A lot of people, of course, are talking about Joe Deceives considering his recent addition to the CDL. Uh, the guys that we played one Challengers event. And here he is. <laughs> he never had any challengers experience before getting a sub spot on LAG. So definitely a unique team, definitely an interesting team. However, what I will say is that uh, I am eager to see what the girls can do. They're going to have to do a lot, though, to really dig themselves out of where you have them right now. Uh, and I will maybe give them a major to kind of figure things out a little bit uh, before they maybe start to actually contend, or I, I should say contend with some of the you know teams that we have in the higher tiers. But we will move on. We've got London, we've got Florida, we've got LAG, and now it is time for Danger Zone. Yes, not only is it a great song, but it's also the next name for our tier list. Now, the term Danger Zone is basically the fact that you, when it comes down to these teams, they're on the brink of having their heads above water, but they're also on the brink of what I believe could be a roster change. I do indeed. We'll start things off with the Las Vegas Legion. That is right. They had their moments. They had their uh, their time in the spotlight. When it came down to the Major 1 tournament, we saw some great moments from them. It felt like the primary question marks around them uh, were on their SMGs. Pro Loot and TJ. I mean, I didn't get to watch every single series. I didn't get to cast over them a few times, but pretty much what I heard from everybody is like, hey, Pro Loot, TJ, they've come to play. Uh, they've come to play. So that is really what you want to see out of Vegas is uh, really a more cohesive unit. Uh, obviously, with the uh, the recent meta changes and whatnot, it feels like the Vaznev has never been more valuable than it is right now. Those guys are playing well. Vegas always stands a better chance. So that was great. Uh, right now, they are the best search and destroy team based off of record, but the worst hard point team. And they are also a bottom three control team. So I'm pretty sure they're the best S&D team. And I want to say based off of like, if you add in all the respawns, technically the worst respawn team in the game uh when it came down to major one i'm pretty sure they won two hard points out of 12. uh so you definitely want to see an improvement there the reason why i have them in danger zone is again because i feel like there is a chance like there was absolutely a chance where vegas can come out be a scary team again be a search destroy mastermind type of roster you know uh early on in the season when it came down to like preseason scrimmages and whatnot they actually looked like they had a good head on their shoulders when it came to hard point 
Uh, so I really am hoping that we can see Vegas be a more of a contender. However, if they do have a major where things are not going right, hard point control, the respawns are just not there, but S and D is, I mean, you can have some great moments, but you're never going to be an amazing team. If you can't walk away with consistent respawns, whether in control or in hard point. So, uh, in danger zone, in danger zone of the fact, like I said, that they could be scary. They could cause some, you know, they could be dangerous to some of our top rosters, but I believe that they also are in danger of the fact that if they don't play well in major two, I think we very well could see a roster change go down with them. The next team that we will chat about and one that is definitely to me in the hot seat is the Boston breach in is the Boston breach. They are one of the more confusing teams. Uh, when it came down to performances at major one, we love them. And I mean, absolutely love them. After week number one, we called Big Wake already one of the best players in the game. They made the perfect roster change, picking up Awakening, adding him in to an already very talented lineup. And after that has taken place, after they start off 2-0, after they looked at, after they look fantastic, they have lost their last four series. Yes, they lost their last four series. They also did lose uh, to a challenger team, got eliminated, didn't make it to the bracket stage. Uh, but Big Wake was sick at Major 1, so that is something that I chatted about numerous occasions uh, when it came down to this lineup, is that they are obviously going to run it back, even though they didn't have the performance that they wanted by any means, uh, because if you didn't make it to the bracket stage, you're definitely not feeling great about yourself. Uh, but there is definitely a case for why they obviously didn't have the greatest of placements. If Awakening wasn't playing well, or other wasn't feeling well, they had to bring in Beans the last second for a series. Things just aren't going to be an accurate uh, depiction of how they really play. Uh, but I do feel like they are on the hot seat. I mean, I mean, again, this is a team that right now, I think based off of most people's opinions, holds the most valuable uh, challenger player right now in the league in Beans that is up for debate. But I think most people, when you think of challengers, probably think of Beans first right now. Um, so... They are kind of on the hot seat. I think if they do have another slow performance, it's not a matter of like, hey guys, you know, major one wasn't great, but hey, you know what? That tournament got away from us. Awakening wasn't feeling well, all of this stuff, new meta change. If they don't play well in major two, I think that they realize, hey, we just may not be a very good team. Uh, so there is that to think about. They've also lost six of their last seven S and Ds that you cannot have if you're obviously not going to win your respawn. So Boston Breach in the danger zone. They can be competitive. They can scare you, but I am also scared about them right now we'll move on to our next team and that is the minnesota rocker yes the minnesota rocker it felt like signs of last season did it not i mean really number one seed after the major one qualifiers we know they got the w versus optic texas but still they by definition had one of the higher seeds uh like i said number one overall and they go into the tournament and bomb out top eight um i would say the biggest positive for sure uh after the opening event is that Afro's the truth, right? We saw Afro look absolutely fantastic. I've never really had a doubt about the guy when it came down to LAN. I think a lot of my colleagues uh, have for sure. I've seen a lot of people talk about online versus LAN. Afro is not the same player. I think it was really just when it came down to environment, the team, the players that he has around him is really affecting that. We saw him have a fantastic major tournament. It just felt like really... The team just wasn't ultimately there. The S&D really took a hit when it came down to Major 1, which is not what you expect when we talk about a Minnesota lineup. Uh, but the positive, if you will, um, is that this is still a new team, right? There is definitely a lot of upside when it comes down to this roster. But you do have those question marks, right? About the Toronto integration of Cami and Bance. Are those guys going to work out? There were questions about Afro. I feel like those have definitely been answered that Afro will be a star type of player when it comes down to this team. But you do have your questions on if this team, if they're not going to be a good S&D team, are they going to be good at respawns? Uh, right now, they actually are one of the best control teams in the game. So it is kind of this balancing act of will Minnesota remain good at control and figure out S&D as they should? Or can they, you know, figure out hard point? Yeah, it's really up in the air, um, but it is going to be interesting to follow the Minnesota Rocker, a team that has a lot of expectations, made some major moves during the offseason. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, you have to look across the stage and you're thinking, hey, you know, some of the players that we let go and Standy playing excellent, Priesta playing excellent. Like it, it is, it is a little troublesome to look across the stage and to see the guys that we did release are having phenomenal performances and we are not. Uh, and we did have a decent sample size, right? At Major 1, they played five matches. And if you look at, you know, what they were able to do uh, when it came down to the tournament, they beat Decimate Gaming 3-0. to zero. They beat LAG, who literally just made a roster change for every player but one. They beat them 3-1. to one. Uh, And then after that, they end up losing uh, to the New York Subliners. They get absolutely smacked around 
uh, when it came down to that series. And then after that one, they later lost to the Toronto Ultra, a team that they beat online. They lose to them on land. And then they lose to the Las Vegas Legion uh, in a game five round 11. So really, when you talk about you know what they were able to do, when we talk about the, uh, the performance of, I don't know, like we just in general just chat about this team, like from top to bottom, it's just not what you want. Like it's, it's, it's not what you expect to see out of a team that holds one of the higher seeds uh, to have that repertoire, to have those results. If you're really looking at what you accomplished, you didn't really accomplish a whole lot and you lost to teams that obviously ended up looking pretty strong at the tournament teams that you hopefully could be better than uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next tier. And we go to two for three, right? Two for three. What does that exactly mean? What I am predicting is that two teams from this tier, we're going to have three teams total. Two of these teams will play well, and I think one will bomb out a bit. That is right. One, I, I think it's not going to have a great performance. That isn't to say that they're not a good team. I just don't foresee them having a great, great major number two. And that team, I'm going to let you know right now. We'll move into this. Seattle Surge. That is right. Wait a second. Hold on. Landon, they just finished top two. They they actually beat the New York Subliners who went on to win the tournament. Where, where are you getting this from? I'm not, I'm not exactly seeing where you have this. Seattle last season was the most up and down team. And they're still that same roster, right? They absolutely are that same roster still. I saw the inconsistency again throughout the major one when it came down to major one. I saw them start off 0-2, not look good to kick off our qualifiers. And then they came back and started to look excellent again. Uh, and obviously they went on to have a second place finish. We saw them overall look very, very strong in a multitude of different ways. We'll chat about that in a moment. But I still feel like this is the same Seattle surge of last season where you're going to have some amazing moments. You've got some fantastic talent on this team. I feel like all four of these guys work so well together, but sometimes they don't, right? Sometimes they just don't have that moment. And so if you're talking about Seattle surge, hey, they just finished second place. They've got to be the second best team in the game. I don't think so. I really don't. I, I, I don't think this is going to be a stage or a qualifier where Seattle surge for the first time in a season and a quarter, if you will, uh, manages to finally figure out how to be ultimately consistent. Because if you do look at what was the difference, right? What was the difference between their qualifiers where they finished a total of one and three, uh, and then whenever they went to the major one tournament and finished second place, what was the difference? It was S&D. Like they went 0-5 during the qualifiers and managed to go 4-5 and during major one. Search Destroy was the difference. Uh, that will continue to be the difference for this team. You do wonder if Hardpoint, right? They're one of the better Hardpoint teams in the game right now. At times, their control is absolutely excellent. We know that at times they were a fantastic control team last year in Vanguard on like maps like Tuscan, for example. Um, I don't know. I just feel like consistency is going to continue to be the problem with this roster. Uh, whenever they are at their best, they are frying, but they do have that potential where not everybody sometimes is performing it the same way uh, that they should. And you know, does the Pred thing, you know, the fact that he was, it sounds like pretty close to going to Optic Texas affect them? I think we can all agree that it doesn't help. Like, I, I, I can totally understand the fact that if you're like, Landon, listen, Seattle Surge, if you think that Pred going to Optic Texas is going to ruin this team, which I don't think that it is, uh, but if you think it's going to ruin this team, you're wrong. I agree. I don't think it ruins the team. I just think we can all agree that Pred potentially going to Optic Texas, expressing that he wanted to go to Optic Texas, uh, doesn't help the chemistry. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes down to that, you know, is there an underlying element to it in some way? I think for sure. Like, I, I think there is some element to it. We could sit here and debate for hours about, you know, the impact of what that could mean. Does it have any impact? Does it have no impact? Uh, I think the fact that, you know, you were waiting to scrimmage, you were waiting to see if your star player was going to go to another team, a team that he wanted to go to, obviously. And then now he, and now he comes back. You know, there could be um, there could be something small that, that happens potentially with the roster, uh, you know, in a way. But I, like I said, my biggest culprit for m maybe them not having the greatest stage is simply just because I feel like they're still going to be a very good roster at times. And sometimes they're just not going to have a stage where they all perform. And it's simply where I leave it. Uh, the Surge also have a very tough schedule in our major two qualifiers. I want to highlight that for this tier, uh, like I said, two for three. A lot of these teams have very, very rough schedules, which is also a primary culprit why I do feel like two of them will succeed. One of them, not so much. Uh, Seattle has Las Vegas, Atlanta, 
Optic. That's going to be a fun one. Uh, New York rematch in Minnesota. That is not an easy schedule. I mean, literally, that is not an easy schedule by any means. You're facing off against Vegas. As we've talked about, a team that is in the danger zone that can cause you problems from time to time. Uh, then you've got to face off against Atlanta. Then Optic Texas with their new team. Uh, then you've got to face off against New York, who obviously is off of the major championship, a team that you just lost to uh, in the finals. And then a Minnesota Rocker team that I think we can all agree looks fantastic online. Question mark still on land, but they did look pretty good uh, when it came down to the major online qualifiers for, for major one. So... Very difficult schedule for Seattle Surge. I hope they prove me wrong, but we will see what happens. Why did I do that? No idea. We'll move on. Optic Texas is our next team. Where were they rank? Where will they be? They are in two for three. They finally made the move. We heard the players discuss uh, already on their different streams and whatnot about what kind of went on behind the scenes a bit. The move was to go for Pred. That doesn't work out, so they end up making the move to go for Hook. There was really not a whole lot of shock for me to learn that information based off of a bit of the rumors. I know there were a few things that were clarified about how we weren't trying to go for a Pred, or I think Shotzi maybe mentioned that, how we weren't originally trying to go for Pred, and then you know eventually it worked out, regardless of, of how it all shapes up. Uh, it was not a surprise to see that the fact that once the Pred stuff didn't really sound like it was going to work out anymore, he basically said that, hey, everything was attempted. It just didn't happen. Uh, they end up going back for Hook, uh, right? This is a reunion uh for this roster i've already talked about this kind of at length on if who ended up joining optic texas what it would mean uh but right you do have the zeo reunion you've got uh shotzi who can illy back together which i think is, is, is always going to be fun to see um i think uh you know when it comes down to who just being a part of optic texas in general is funny right he was envy's golden boy for years uh, played multiple tournaments, you know, for them. Obviously won uh, the Dallas Empire Championship with Shotzi and Illy back in the first year of the CDL. Uh, and then it's also funny, too, because Optic has been a franchise, a team, rather, that has always wanted to get Hook in years previous, and now they've got their opportunity to have him uh, on the lineup. Now, one of the most interesting things about this uh, to me is the fact that, obviously, Optic Texas decided to add an SMG. Why is that significant? It's because Scump and Shotzi's pace was way off at major one scump goes to the flex illy goes to the main ar we know that hook will slide in as the second smg alongside of shotzi and the reason why a lot of people wanted to see shotzi and scump separate in the smg position see scump go over to a flex uh is because of pace uh shotzi was number two this is in uh, major one only at the tournament specifically shotzi was number two in hard point damage per 10 minutes scump was dead last out of everybody and hardpoint damage per 10 minutes. Uh, and hardpoint kills per 10 minutes. Shotzi was number 13. That's actually pretty high. Uh, and then hardpoint kills per 10 minutes for Scump. He was number 39. Uh, so you can kind of see, right? Your SMGs need to be much closer than that. Oftentimes, if your SMGs are in a higher stat line when it comes down to that, if they're pretty close to each other, that is a good sign. And so far, it sounds like uh, what I had hoped that we would see, which is that both of these guys and now who can Shotzi together are going to play at a much faster pace. I think Hook is at his best whenever he's really up in the face of the opposition, allowing for Shotzi to roam a little bit more. Uh, I think they're going to be in the best spot. And based off of uh, what I believe that Shotzi's even said on stream already is that he and Hook are just kind of running at people. And it's seeming to work out pretty well. I know one of their scrimmage results got leaked. They beat somebody like 6-2. to two, So it sounds like things are starting off pretty well. Uh, I do have my questions about really when it comes down to the ARs now, right? Illy for the first time, or at least one of the first times as a main AR. I know by definition, he's kind of played as a main, but as a flex progressively, but in the actual position itself, uh, I am interested to see how he plays, obviously. And then Scump his first time uh, on a full-time AR for a long time uh, in the last decade. So that'll be fun to see how that ends up working out. To me, I don't really have questions about the SMGs. I just have questions on how the ARs are going to perform. Uh, Optic Texas also, as I said, similar to, to Seattle, they also do have a very tough major two. Uh, they've got Boston, they've got Seattle, they've got Toronto, they've got Vegas, and they've got Atlanta. Optic Texas could play very well in major two and still finish two and three. That is, that is, is, that's the end of it, right? I mean, you could play very strong. You can have a very good performance and still finish with a two and three record. It's not going to be an easy time for Optic Texas. And you could argue that opening match versus Boston is a necessary, a must win for them. Uh, to close it out, I mean, I like the change. Ultimately, I think if you can get something for Dashy later on, which is to me the biggest piece of all of this uh, that is not going to be chatted about right now, 
is that I think the Dashy stock goes up, goes up after major two. If you can maybe get some money for him, if you can obviously trade him to another team and then maybe upgrade again. Uh, when it comes down to this lineup, I think you're in an even better spot. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll talk about this for right now. Uh, but I would say that I'm not. Um, I would not be shocked if we see another change of some sort go down with Optic Texas after Major 2, considering that you are basically having three new roles. I mean, you've got Hook as a new player. You've got Skump in a new role. You've got Ilya in a new role. So it would not be surprising if Major 2 is that testing period that we've talked about here, uh, and they decide, you know what, maybe this role isn't working out for this player. Let's bring in somebody else, or let's bring in a main AR for Ilya. Let's bring in a new SMG for Hook. He's not playing as well as we thought, et cetera, et cetera. We will move on. Two for three. We're staying here and we're chatting now about the LA Thieves. Yes. Uh, again, you know, it's a similar, not, not similar in the in the same fact of how they started off Vanguard, but it's another slow performance. It's, it's not the performance that they wanted. Uh, I think there was definitely a level of concern that could exist if they experience another top six placement uh, when it comes down to major two. I think this is a team that definitely needs to have uh, a top four placement, I would say at bare minimum uh, for them to maybe not be somewhat worried about their lineup right now. But the biggest thing for me and something that I've learned after watching uh, the 0 to 100 series, you know, multiple times over again with this same roster uh, is that this is a team that hates, hates to make mistakes and oftentimes will dwell a lot on the issues that they make in game. Sometimes that's a positive. And I think sometimes the dwelling on issues sometimes could be a negative for them specifically. Uh, on, on certain players individually, which we'll chat about. Uh, but I've got a lot of confidence in the LA Thieves. I do. I have a lot of confidence that the Thieves will fix the issues uh, that they dealt with in their losses at Major 1, right? They lost some clutch hard points. They lost uh, quite a few clutches. And that uh, and the search destroying hotel versus Toronto, they allow for Scrappy to clutch out a 1v2. They allow for Insight to clutch out a 1v2. Um, so I think for Thieves, it's a team that I trust. It really is. And I think there is a... A bit of a good news, bad news a bit. If you are the Thieves, I would say new spawns. I like for LAT to figure those out early. I think that's a positive. Uh, I think they're a team that, as we learned from Vanguard, they can figure out how to work strategy. They can figure out how to master uh, the game while in the midst of chaos. Vanguard was absolute chaos. Uh, I know that players are starting to figure out the spawns more. Uh, as as we you know scrimmage more and play eights more and whatnot uh, after the recent update here in MW2, but I think that LAT is a team that you do like when it comes down to these moments of question marks, like how our team's going to adapt to this. I think that Thieves are great at doing that. I think they showed us that in Vanguard, and if it's chaotic, I feel like they're a team that can figure out figure out a way to get their way through the weeds, if you will, uh, of that. And I would say the good news is that the bad news is. You know, the SMG influence, we, we, we all know it, right? The Vaznev, it feels like it's getting stronger by the day. Players are consistently talking about it. Uh, and Kenny, who is one of your SMGs on this team, did not have a great major one individually. Uh, I think for sure, and to, to get back at the point we shared about earlier, I don't know if this is it for me. I've watched a decent amount of VOD, uh, and it's definitely more of a prediction. It's by no means like, hey, this is what happened to Kenny. Uh, but I do think a bit of it was a lot of focusing on the team more than more, maybe more of a self-focus. I think that Kenny was so cautious and aware of the mistakes that they were making at times. Uh, you know, maybe the lanes they weren't watching, the positions that they weren't focusing on, etc. And I do think that it definitely affected his gameplay in a certain extent. Uh, so you do have your question marks right. We know that Kenny did not start off great when it came down to the SMG last season in Vanguard. There was no shock that start of the season, everybody from the Thieves was called upon to be dropped. Everybody was called upon to, you know, to be released from the team. We saw a decent amount of role changes. Will we see it again? I don't think so. I think that you love right now what Itanes do, and I think that Draza uh, is one of my favorite players moving into Major 2. So I think that Kenny's going to stay here. I think he figures out his game, and I like the LA Thieves to be able to, uh, to make their way through the weeds of the new spawn updates that we have seen in the game. That is it for two for three. Let's move on to our top tier and close out this video. And we're calling it top dogs. I know how original is that? Uh, but we're going to start things off with the Atlanta phase. I give them the nod to be an S tier. You know, I don't know if everybody's going to have them an S tier. It feels like if you don't have them an S, everyone's like, wait a second. You, you think after one event, Atlanta phase isn't good anymore. And then if you have them in a tier below, People think the exact opposite. Like, you know, wait a second. Are you are, are you thinking that Atlanta Phase is, uh, uh, you know, the same team that they were in prior titles? You know, it, it is what it is. I have Atlanta Phase as a top three team right now. 
Uh, I know even though they did lose to New York and Seattle, uh, they did pretty well, you know, to handle a few different teams. You know, they beat a, a top caliber team in Toronto Ultra. Uh, again, the same kind of situation with LAT. There is a level of worry, right? If Atlanta phase doesn't have a high placement in major two, right? I mean, if you, if you find yourself outside of the top two and back-to-back -back tournaments, there is the instant comparison of like, hey, well, at least last season we were in finals. This season, we're not even sniffing a finals. Um, so I think there is an element to that. Uh, but I think that the Atlanta phase uh, does definitely need to tune their game a little bit. Uh, I think that for, at least in my opinion, I think that you, if you can make a shift when it comes down to the roster, I would love for there to be more of a highlight, maybe more of a, more of an emphasis to play around the SMGs of the team. You know, I, I was looking at some of the KDs and by no means do KDs tell the full story. Uh, and I know that there has been constant combos, constant conversations about people saying, hey, you know what, Selium, he's playing for stats. Selium's not playing for stats. But I do think that there is an element of like, hey, you know what, maybe we need to allow for Simp and Abizi to be maybe more put in positions to succeed, allow for Selium to maybe not play so heavily around, uh, you know, life type of situations, maybe allow for him to get more involved in the fray that helps Abizi and Simp out a bit. However, that would work. Uh, I think that you should definitely try to play around the SMGs more than his Landon's critique. Uh, but ultimately, it's a big test again for FaZe with a new spawn update. Uh, they are a team that is prone at times to making mistakes. They are a team that is prone to not figuring out their mistakes when it comes down to end game. Uh, I think there will be a bigger focus on Slasher's role when it comes down to this team in Major 2. They did not have a bad Major 1. Uh, it is a new roster. You know, Atlanta FaZe for two years had the, pretty much the exact same team. So there is an element of like, hey... We do now have this new roster. How do we want to fix these situations? How do we want to work as a roster? How do we want to fix certain things? And again, I think if you do have a bigger element focused on the SMGs, I mean, historically, Simp and Abizi, best SMG duo of all time. You're not worried at all if Simp and Abizi's gun now is much stronger in game. And that is the reason why I feel like if Atlanta Phase does find a way to focus more on Simp and Abizi to highlight those guys, to, to put them in positions more to succeed, uh, I think they'll be at a fantastic spot and only get better. So we'll see how that ends up going for them. But as I said, you do have some question marks. If they don't find themselves in a finals, if, they, if, you, if you maybe see them bomb out of a tournament in some way, there could be an element to it uh, where you start to draw questions and think, hey, you know what? Is it is this no longer Atlanta phase anymore? Like, is this not the same Atlanta uh, that we have learned to expect from the past three years of the CDL? Uh, we'll move on to our next team. And that is the Toronto Ultra. Now, I feel like there's a lot of people who do kind of have the same mentality on Ultra uh, to kind of put them high, to, to have high expectations around this team um, and to think, you know, I don't know. It feels like there's a lot of people who are like kind of giving Ultra their flowers very early, but I'll be honest, it's hard not to. Like, I know that Ultra lost a phase, but yet I have Ultra higher than Atlanta. It is what it is. It's because of the trajectory that I think that we will see Toronto take, uh, considering as well, this is their first event together, right? This is a very new team. You've got Insight and Kleenex who have got a lot of history together, uh, as we know, but you're bringing in Scrappy. You're bringing in Standy, two very new players, and right now, the experiments worked out great. I mean, for, I mean, to be honest with you, like there's a lot of people who were very critical of the move that Toronto made. A lot of people wanted them to run it back. I mean, there was an element to me where it was like, hey, you know what? I appreciate that everyone wants to see this team go back again and, and you know, to, to have the Toronto of old come into a new title. It was time to, to change it up. It was. It was time to change it up. And Toronto was seeing that in spades already, right? The additions that you made, you bring in Scrappy, already looking like one of the best players in the game, drop the 40 bomb on the LA Thieves in a huge, huge series. Uh, we have seen Stanley have one of, he's honestly been one of the best surprises uh, so far of the start of MW2 with how great that he has looked. Just has been so consistent uh, when it comes down to respawns. s and I feel like has been top notch as well. Uh, and right now they sit as one of the best control teams in the game. They're a top three S and D team uh, in the game right now. Five of their eight hard point losses, which right now is their weakest game mode. Five of their eight HP losses come within 20 points. So you feel like this is a team that is starting to figure out the game modes. And this is a good sign. If you are a Toronto fan, if you are watching teams from a distance and wondering, hey, which team is going to be on the upward, which team is going to be on the downward, etc. Typically the teams that can be around, I would say, if they can have a specialty in two out of the three game modes and be above 500 in the other one, 
that is a team that has a very good and a very high likelihood of not just being in a final, but winning a championship. Uh, and so right now it is very early on in the season. There's a lot of chance that things could go down, that they could not, you know, have success in certain modes. But it feels like right now, as I said, top three S and D team, they're one of the best control teams right now. They've really seemed to figure out that mode quite well. Uh, and then I feel like if they just can clutch out a few more moments in hard point, you know, start to fine tune a bit of those things, uh, you know, some of the issues, I feel like Toronto is also a team that if things start to no pun intended, get a little bit more scrappy. I like actually ultra and this new spawn update. I, I really do. I think I like ultra more than I did uh, already when it comes to hard point with the spawns being the way that they are. Um, so you know, if I had Kleenex spawning right next to somebody on Hydro, I like his chances of winning that gunfight. The same thing can be said for Scrappy. The same thing can be said absolutely for Kleenex. Same thing can be said for, for Insight. So uh, again, just a team that I feel like is on the upward trajectory. It's their first event. They look great in two out of the three game modes. And I think that third one actually does get better just in general, but also gets better because of the recent spawn update. I really like Ultra right now. I see the upside and we'll see if this team can get better after a top four finish at major number one we move forward and there's no surprise here it is our major one champions the new york subliners now i will say this it is it doesn't always have to be that the team who just won the most recent event has to be the first team it doesn't always have to be that way but i will say that it has to be new york right now uh, because we've only seen one event and honestly because of how good that they looked like how good across the board that each player ended up performing. Uh, it's also called Top Dogs because you got the Bulldog and you got P-Dog. So there is the story uh, behind the name there. Uh, but no, just in general, the way that they were able to, to win Major 1 was fantastic. Uh, you know, it just felt like they closed it out in a convincing way. You know, they went 4-1 to in the finals. There was no question mark on who was the best team at the tournament. It was NYSL. We didn't leave thinking like, hey, you know, if this situation goes differently for Seattle, if the, you know, if this... You know, certain game mode, if it doesn't go to a round 11, there was none of that. There was none of that for New York uh, after the horrendous, and I mean horrendous, 0-2 start that they had after week number one. They've gone on to win eight of their last nine series uh, after looking lost in s &D, losing both of those search destroys to kick off major one. They've gone nine and four in that game mode since. Uh, their control looks untouchable. They're fantastic on Fortress. They are especially amazing on Hotel. I expect teams to start banning that versus them, or at least to watch a lot of their VOD to figure out how they're winning all of these attacks, how they're constantly 3-0-ing teams on this map and mode. Um, and I would say from the opening match of Major 1, right, you know, when it came down to the Pro-Am, not qualifiers, uh, from the opening match that they had versus LAG, Jay and I actually casted it on Bravo. You could tell, like, they were going to have a good tournament. And the reason for that was that they were playing against LAG, you know, LAG, we didn't really know, again, how the team was going to perform. I wasn't super high on the gorillas already, uh, but they came out, they beat them 250 to like 80 uh, in the hard point. Then they go in to win the S&D, and then they 3 0 them in the control, and it was like, okay, LAG is not that bad in terms of like a team that should be getting 100-point club or at least 80-point club in a hard point, uh, getting 3 0 in the control, losing an S&D. I, I don't know if the S&D was super close, um, but still, you could just tell, and it felt like LAG was absolutely overwhelmed and that is what new york did to so many different teams it felt like uh throughout this past tournament was they were fantastic at overwhelming you yet also knowing where each other were on the map and i give so much credit to that uh to kismet i feel like like normally you'd say like pound for pound a player is like one of the best in the game i feel like if we're talking on like life for life or engagement per engagement i feel like kismet might be the best player in the game right now not based at all off of statistics, but based off of what he does for the team. Like he really is in what I have called for years, like the karma role, where you don't always have to be putting up monumental numbers. But if you do, that team is winning that game. That team is winning that series because that player sometimes has to be called upon. If that player recognizes, hey, you know what? My Slayers aren't playing as well as they you know, should be in this series, or there's a cut that I need to watch. I need to perform in this S&D, in this clutch moment. He ends up doing that. Karma did that for years. It feels like Kisman is doing that on the SMG right now. Uh, like I said, pound for pound, engagement for engagement, life for life, whatever you want to call it. It feels like when it comes into communication, when it comes down to just where he's at on the map, He's aware. He is so aware of what he's doing on the map. Uh, I feel like that just helps Hydra out so much to put up the numbers that he does. Um, 
And I'll say too, like Hydra is absolutely terrifying. Like he is terrifying on the map. Feels like he is flying. He's gliding around different maps. Uh, his aggression was felt. And honestly, he played very well, but there were series that I watched that I casted where he was by no means the star player of the series. Like there was times where I was casting over him. He dropped like a 0 0.95 and everybody else 1.1s across the board. You saw Skies look amazing. Uh, we saw Priesta have an unbelievable turnaround. To me, that was one of the best stories of the entire tournament uh, was how well that Priesta looked. We know, right, the CDL so far for him has been rough. These last three years have not been amazing for him. I should say the last two years, right? The first year was on Atlanta phase and, you know, in a lot of finals. Um, but the past two seasons on like Minnesota Rocker have not been amazing for him. And he looked spectacular. Uh, when it came down to this tournament, it feels like for him and Skies, I mean, having that gun in their hands, right? Being able to perform uh, when it comes down to the new meta, it just feels like it works out very, very well for them. Uh, to me, it feels like not only are Hydra and Kismet looking like the best SMG duo in the game, but they feel like the most coordinated SMG duo in the game. And I feel like a lot of that obviously comes from Hydra's ability, his, his talent, but I feel like a lot of it comes from the guy who's making all the calls uh, in Kismet. So... That's going to be it for our tier list, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, top dogs, two for three, danger zone, any given day, and erm. Let me know what your thoughts are based off of this tier list. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Uh, if you guys made it to this point in the video, you can. I would love it. I would absolutely love it if you like this video, if you subscribe to the channel. As I said, this will be a series that we keep up before every single major uh, doing these tiers highlighting each and every single team and letting you guys know where I have them ranked moving into our next major tournament, which is going to be in Boston. Excited for it. Uh, like I said, guys, thank you so much for the support on the channel. I hope that you enjoyed my tier list and uh, I'll see you back here on the channel. Actually, the next day or so, we've got Lando's Lockins coming out, a lot of content as well leading up into major two. So stay tuned for that. And I'll see you guys back here on the channel very soon.